This is Steve Kelly, and I'm the host of Democratically Speaking, and my, my guest today is Scott Becky, who's running for Plymouth County Sheriff. Thank Welcome. you for having me. Glad to have you. So, you know, one of the things I think a lot of people might not understand is what is the role of sheriff in Plymouth County? Yeah, the sheriff has a pretty important role in Plymouth County. The first and foremost is the care and custody of uh, persons remanded to the correctional facility. And they also hold people that are awaiting trial that uh, either can't make bail or being held as, as, a, as a reason that they, they can't be let back out, whether they're considered dangerous or, or something like that. But the, the primary function of the sheriff is that, is the care and custody of people remanded to his facility. Uh, they also provide a lot of support services to law enforcement agencies throughout the county. They have the Bureau of Criminal Investigation, which, uh, as you know, helps out in Brockton at crime scenes. They'll take photographs, process fingerprints. Uh, if there's a break, somebody gets uh, a house broken into or something like that, they'll come up to assist the Brockton police if their detectives aren't available. Um, they also have a canine unit, uh, which again, you know, assists the communities throughout the county, whether there's a, uh, a dangerous suspect that needs to be tracked down or if it's a lost child or a lost elder that they need help finding. Uh, there's, uh, I want to say there's probably about uh, 10 or 12 canines right now. Uh, a lot of their canines are also trained as, as drug, drug detection dogs, uh, so they help uh, both inside the facility and outside of the facility. Uh, they'll do assist the, the towns at ser school searches sometimes when they come in and check lockers and stuff like that. Uh, but again, the, the, the primary responsibility is the correctional facility, which is located in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. And uh, they do provide a lot of ancillary services throughout the county. Up here in Brockton, you have the Civil Process Division. Um, if you were to uh, sue somebody, you'd have to get them served with process and you'd contact the Civil Process Division to, to get that done. If you were going to get somebody evicted, um, you would contact them and they would assist with getting a bonded mover and they'd send deputies out to evict people. So, so they have a lot of, a lot of different uh, responsibilities. Uh, most of it is assisting law enforcement, assisting the police departments throughout the county. They also have a, a, a big responsibility to the fire departments that most people don't realize. If, um, if an ambulance uh, say an ambulance in Brockton goes out and somebody has a, um, you know, a heart condition or something right. and, the, and the ambulance calls the hospital for pre-arrival instructions, that communication travels through the Sheriff's Department communication okay. to the hospital, uh, what's known as County Emergency Medical Dispatch or CMED. They, uh, they also help the fire departments with county fire control. If Brockton had a big fire and they needed help from West Bridgewater, um, for the mutual aid channel they'd, they'd use county fire control. And the Sheriff's Department has a command post, and on the, the door of it, there's a fire patch. And the reason is, is it was bought with a fire grant, okay. and it's supposed to be at any three alarm or greater fire throughout the county. So they do provide a lot of, a lot of services. Uh, their primary focus, care and custody of inmates, um, but they secondarily support a lot of uh, the police and fire agencies throughout the county. And you've got a lot of experience relative to, you know, corrections. Yes, I do. Um, it goes all the way back to when I was in the Marines. In 1991, um, after we came back uh, from our deployment, the, I, was, uh, I didn't have enough time left in the Marines to, to redeploy, and my unit was, was turning around really quick, so they made me what's called a chaser. And uh, I would take people who uh, committed transgressions during the first Gulf War, I would take them from the brig to their trial and back to the brig. So I, I started learning uh, you know, correctional uh, stuff then. When I got out of the Marines, my first uh, real job was with the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department. And for uh, almost a year and a half, I worked in the, uh, the House of Correction at South Bay in Suffolk County. So what would be a typical inmate that we're dealing with? Uh, we've got to remember that we're talking about the House of Correction, where they're only sentenced to two and a half years or less. And it's usually minor crimes, um, what they call misdemeanors. Uh, most of your felony uh, people that are sentenced for felonies or sentenced to two and a half years or more are sentenced to the state prison. Plymouth County actually does hold some state inmates and what they do is, is if they rent the, uh, the space out to the state and they hold the inmates and the state pays them to hold the inmates. They also um, they hold some of the federal ICE detainees. Right. Um, that's a big issue with what's going on right now in the city of Brockton. Uh, the, they also um, I'm sorry, the, 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 the federal, the state, and they had Whitey Bulger down right, there. that's one when, of the things I was going to yeah, bring up. They had the Whitey Bulger, they had the shoe bomber. And the reason is, is they're the closest correctional facility to the, the uh, federal district court in Boston. Right. So that's why they'll, what they'll do is, is uh, the federal government will pay them to hold those inmates. And they've held a lot of high-profile inmates, and, and the correctional staff down there does an outstanding job. 
you know, and that's their primary function. Their primary function is to hold people. And we started talking about uh, people, why are they in the House of Correction? You know, they're sentenced to two and a half years or less, which means that they're going to be coming back out to the communities, you know, fairly quickly. And, you know, you're talking drunk drivers, whether it's a domestic, uh, domestic abuse type situation, um, you know, a low-level drug offense. You know, those are some of your typical inmates. Okay, and so an issue that you're dealing with is recidivism. Recidivism is a, a very important issue, especially here in the city of Brockton. So what are we doing to make that better? What's going on now? Uh, and, you know, what we're doing now, I, I, my short answer is not enough. Um, we really have to focus on lowering recidivism. And there's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. There's no one answer. There's no um, you know, one panacea that solves everything. It's, uh, it's like an onion. When you peel an onion back, onion back there's another layer underneath. Um, there's everything from addiction counseling. You know, we need to, you know, a lot of these people that are coming in and they might be sentenced to um, a couple of years for breaking into a house. Uh, but what we need to look is why did they break into that house? Was, is it to support a drug habit? You know, and, and if, they, if it was, then one of the things that we need to do is, is intensive, uh, you know, addiction treatment. You know, I'm a big fan of, of the Vivitrol shots. Um, some correctional facilities are using those and what they do is they block the cravings. Um, they, they allow people to, to detox and, without the cravings. Um, they also, what we need to do is intensive AA and NA. But not just the programs while they're inside, we need to ensure that they're partnered with sponsors in the community when they get out. That's that when they come back to Brockton, that they, ha they have somebody to reach out to if they feel themselves slipping. And that's the, the benefit to the AA and NA program is sponsors. Sponsors in the community that help people. So part of what you're doing is trying to establish volunteers that come in to yep. work with inmates while they're yep. in, and then are sponsors for them when they get out if they have an addiction Exactly, issue. and that's part of the reintegration process is ensuring that they have a sponsor set up for them in the community for once they came. So when they go back, they have a support network. The other part is, is we really need to do more job training. We need to uh, ensure not, not, not just job training across the board, but we have to look at what type of jobs can people get when they get out. And that's an important thing is, is you can train somebody to be a nuclear physicist, um, but that doesn't mean they're getting a job as one. Because you're dealing with the Corey issue that sometimes Exactly, and, 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 and you know, whether we like it or not, even with Corey reform, there is a stigma to somebody that has a record, um, that has an issue on their Corey, it could block them from certain jobs. So we need to look into the community and say, well, what types of jobs are available in the community? And then confirm the training inside exactly. to match um, the abilities of what they can do. Yeah, if we, if we look to Suffolk County with Sheriff Tompkins, he's actually done a great job. Uh, one of the programs he has, vocational program, is, is carpentry, teaching them how to frame, how to square, you know, how to build, you know, houses. Because that's there's, there's always houses being built, so that's a job that they, you know, that they can get with a quarry. Um, they, you know, teaching them. They actually have them build, uh, you know, uh, walls, you know, square them up, make sure they're good, take them apart, um, teach them how to do roofs. Down in Plymouth, they actually do a lot of work out on the farm, so you can actually have the inmates and the work crews out there practicing these skills. The other things, uh, Sheriff Tom, uh, Tompkins in Suffolk bought sewing machines, teaching them how to be tailors, how to work, you know, work in a, in, a, in, a, in a tailor shop. That's a job that you can get with a quarry. And I thought that was a great idea. I mean, how much does a dozen sewing machines cost? You know, when you get somebody to teach them how to sew, and it's a valuable life skill at, at the least. Uh, barbering is a commonly, you know, attained skill in, in, inside the correctional facility, but partnering with um, the Plymouth South High School's cosmetology program, they actually have a, a program down there. And if we could get some of those instructors to come in and have these people not just learn how to barber, because being a barber is one of the most heavily regulated uh, licenses right. in Massachusetts. So if we can get them the initial training and then start getting them working towards their barber hours to actually become a licensed barber, um, and that's a job that you, you can definitely find. You know, I think we saw an article in the, uh, the Enterprise about a local barber that went above and beyond to help a handicapped person. And I now mean, one, of our, one of the Brockton Democratic City Committee members is working on a GoFundMe yep, to, build to a ramp. have a ramp. Exactly. And Jake Taggart yeah. is doing that. And then Jake Taggart does a lot of great things in the community. Yes, one of the things I was looking at at the Plymouth County website is they have a couple of skills doing offset printing. And as far as the only thing that they really seem to have going on now is the offset pr printing. But, and as you said, they need to have more yeah. kinds of skills. The, the, uh, the print shop's been, in, uh, been working for, for quite some time now. 
Um, you know, they do, they do some stuff in the, in the print shop. They help nonprofits and such. Um, it's a valuable place, and, you know, in, inmates do learn a skill. The, uh, the one thing that we have to recognize is, you know, there's a limited number of print shops to find them jobs in. Even fewer that so, are going on now. A lot so, of uh, so that's, an, and actually, I know I've talked with people in that industry about partnering and, you know, and, and, and creating a pathway, you know, for the inmates that learn those skills. You know, the print shop down there does a great job. I'm not taking anything away from it. I think we can, you know, bring it up a little bit. We can, you know, increase the, um, the, uh, the quality of the embroidery. You know, the, the, uh, they use a little finer nowadays with the electronic embroidery and everything like mm -hmm. that. It uses a little a finer needle, a finer, you know, to make it a more precise. There's a few things that we can improve down there. But I, as generally, I think they do a great job. But we need to reach beyond that. And not only just, you know, those vocational skills that I talked about, but online training. You know, when we were kids, there wasn't a classroom full of computers. They remember when they wheeled the, the cart with the, uh, the Commodore 64s and right. the, all the old DOS and we sat there and everything was, you had to enter all the code. So why can't we have a cart full of iPads with keyboards and wheel that into a unit and give a computer class, introduction to computers, how to productively use Word, Excel, you know, the Microsoft Office suite, how to search LinkedIn and use the internet to find jobs. I mean, those are skills. You're talking there's, a, there's units full of inmates that need something to do during the day, that need to, need to be productively engaged. And again, not all of them will want to participate, but the ones that you get to participate, if you teach them how to use the internet productively, they're going to be way better off when it comes to job searching. A few years ago, Massachusetts switched from the GED to the high set. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues that had come up with it is that a lot of the correctional facilities, you know, it's going to be a computer-based system, and mm -hmm. a lot of the correctional facilities weren't able to yep. accommodate the, mm -hmm. you know, the um, computerized and, system. Well, it's, it's hard when you, uh, you know, when you look back, we all used to have, I mean, it was just a couple of years ago, we all had desktops. And in the last couple of years, everything's flipped over, and now everybody has a tablet. Everybody has an iPad. My, I know my wife has. She puts her tablet and plugs the keyboard into it, and that's ninety percent of what she uses for when, you know, when she does computer stuff. And we've come in leaps and bounds and technologically in the last couple of years. So I think it's it's uh, it's not quite as much of a leap as it would be to use that type of uh, um, uh, you know uh, uh, technology to, uh, to to do that. I don't There's think so much that available really. available resources that you can use to teach literacy to people mm -hmm. that need it. You know, in my career with the state, I worked for the state for 40 years, and I did a lot of employment and training work. I saw a lot of people from the Suffolk County, you know, I worked in Boston, mm -hmm. and a lot of times we would have people from the Suffolk County House of Corrections that would be homeless, and they'd end up in my office seeking food stamps. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the job training skills they had was the biggest issue. So I think what you're doing is trying to bridge that gap yep. between what's out there now and creating a new resources. Uh, and, and Suffolk County, you know, they, they historically have had good job training programs. They, they had inmates that worked in the garage that learned, you know, skills to, you know, to not quite be an auto mechanic, but to, to work in that environment, whether it was changing oil or basic car, you know, car repair skills. Uh, but recently, you know, under Sheriff Tompkins, they've, they've grown in leaps and bounds as far as targeting different jobs, looking into the community to say what jobs are available, and then trying to train people for those jobs. I really think your idea of carpentry skills would really um, work well in that, you know, I, I had a lot of work done on my house, construction, mm -hmm. and being in the employment and training field, I would oftentimes uh, ask people, well, what are you looking for? And does a quarry matter? Because at the middle of the time, you know, back when I was having the work done, I sat on the EOHS quarry reform committee representing DTA. And things were just coming up. So we had to look at what kind of job skills are out there, what can people get, and how to... And that's, that's the important part, is identifying realistic jobs that people with a quarry, that once they leave the correctional facility, that they get and in, get into and reintegrate into their community and be a successful and productive citizen of their community when they return back. And, and, that's, and that's the primary job of the sheriff. The primary job of the sheriff is to take these people who've been remanded to their care and custody and make them better and return them to their communities in better shape than they got them.
So part of what would also come with that is a stat, you know, one of the things that was out there was federal grants for mentoring programs. Would you, you know, you know with faith-based organizations, mm -hmm. would that be something you would be working towards? Oh, yes. Uh, and, and like I said, I, I believe Teen Challenge, one of the, one of the big reasons why Teen Challenge is so successful with an 86% success rate is because they're faith-based. And you can't, you know, church and state, you have to, you know, the separation, you can't force faith on anybody, but the successful programs do have a faith component. And as long as, as, long as the, you're not forcing in a faith belief, one, one type of faith belief on somebody, you know, that they seek it out on their own, I think that those are very successful programs. And one of the things that I want to do, especially up here in the city of Brockton, is reach out to the churches of Brockton. Reach out to, to all the different communities, reach out to the, to the pastors, the reverends, and engage them so that when we have a citizen of Brockton that's remanded to the care and custody at Plymouth County, that when they return, they have a point of contact. They can go to their church. They can go to another church that's nearby and have a support network that'll help them when they get out. Because if they come back and they have no, nothing except a PMB bus ticket and they get off, the bus and they're back in Brockton and they have nowhere to go and no one to, 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 that'll help them, they're, they're doomed to failure. You're setting them up for failure. But if we reach out to the churches, if we reach out to these communities and, and we have that support network out there, so when they come back, you know, they, the support network can help them find some place to stay, to help, help them start their job searches, to make sure that they're getting into the AA and NA meetings and all those things. I think just that alone sets them up for a greater chance of success. And that's exactly what they need, is that successful reintegration. Yeah. Otherwise, we're spending money on a continuing cycle. And, the, uh, and, and there, is, there, is, um, you know, there is a religious program down there. They do have access to, to faith services inside the correctional facility. But what I'm talking about is reaching out to the, to the churches of Brockton, reaching out to the churches of the, of the towns of the county, and engaging them and saying, come in here, come in here and help us. Help us find the solution. Help be part of the solution. And I think that's going to be tremendously successful. So setting up a more volunteer base that you've mm -hmm. got people coming there's, out. There's tons of people that want to help. They just don't know how. And, or, and actually, like right now, you know, they, they have their, you know, their internal prison ministry, but they don't, they're not as welcoming as I think they should be to the, to the other churches. I think they should welcome everybody in you know, and welcome all the churches and all the different groups in because they want to help. And... Even when it comes down to the Rotarians, the Lions, the Kiwanis, like all these people want to help. They just need somebody that can say, hey, look, come in. This is how you can help us. And so you set up the kind of practice that you've got somebody coming in. Then you have a continuity yeah. with people. And, and you create that support network. You create the, 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 no, you know, the no kid net that doesn't let them fall through. Because when they get out, they have all these people that can help them. And so part of what you also might look at is developing an alternative type sentencing. Mm -hmm. So instead of having people go well, to... Well, that's one of the things that we, we you know, you can work with um, the drug courts, you can work with the judges, and, and I personally would like to work closely with the judges of Plymouth County because um, the funny story is, is back when I was a corrections officer, I was, I, when I got hired as a corrections officer, there was no training. On my third day on the job, I was in a unit with 128 inmates at rec with a set of keys and a radio. And, uh, and I was, you, you, learned the, you learned the job on your own. It was sink or swim. They put me into, uh, into New Man one time, and uh, that's where they come from court to be before they're classified, and they're on single man cells. And, and I, I was new, so I wound up on 11 to 7. At 6 o'clock in the morning, there was an inmate banging on his cell. And he goes, hey, you got to let me out. And I go, go back to bed. And he's like, no, 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 you got to let me out. I'm like, look, I know I'm new, but I'm not that new. And, and, it, and afterwards, you know, you know he, kept, he kept up at it. And I said, I said, look, look, knock it off. And finally, some, they called from booking, and they're like, hey, where's so-and-so? And I'm like, <laughs> he's in a cell. Why? They go, oh, no, you've got to let him out. He was doing weekends. <laughs> he had been sentenced to serve his time on weekends. And so here you so are. That, and, and I was new. I had no idea of this type of alternative sentencing. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, well, well, we'll get him right down to you. And, um, and that's, you know, that, that kind of stuck with me that you, know, you can look at working with the courts in these alternative type sentencing. You know, a lot, right now we're doing a lot with intensive probation, we're doing the ankle bracelets. Um, so as sheriff, I think we could engage that a little bit further. And like I said, you know, and this is 20, um, 24 years ago, 
you know, when I learned, oh, like, no kidding, people do time on weekends. And the reason was, was because he would go out and he'd work Monday through Friday and he was serving time for drunk driving, but he needed to support his family. So he would come in on Friday night after work and he'd get, you know, put in a cell and he'd live in the house of correction for the weekend. And yeah. th those are the type of sentences that we can, we can look to work at with. It, it and a need, so it's a need to have that alternative. So yes. instead of wasting a lot yeah. of money, and, and like I said, you know, these aren't new issues. This was 24 years ago when there was a guy serving time on weekends for drunk driving. Um, I think that we've kind of lost track of that, you know, in that in the whole lock them up, you know, and put them away. If you if you lock them up and warehouse them, they're just going to come back, and they're not going to come back any better than you than they went in. Yeah, one of the new things I've seen in other parts of the state, in the other parts of the country that they're doing, is this pay for success grants mm -hmm. where they're using bond money. Like New York State has a program. But I, unfortunately, I just showed you earlier today. Yeah. The, but, um, there's, there's, there's tons, and, and you know, not to get to, uh, wrapped around one specific program, but there's tons of things like that. There's federal grants, there's state grants, there's, there's a lot of, if you have somebody to seek out these funds, there's ways to pay for all of this. And, and I think that that's an important thing is, you know, we can't just run around creating, uh, you know, concepts with no mechanism to fund them. But if we look to these grants, if we look to the federal government, if we look to the state government, whether it's uh, you know to combat combat the opiate addiction, there's a lot of grants out there for that right now, and you know that's one of the things with the Vivitrol shots is the funding for the Vivitrol shots, and you know when they when they return to the community, once they are out in the community, there's no mechanism to go you know to have them come back so that you can keep giving them the Vivitrol shots, and those are things that we need to work at. I don't have all the answers but I'm smart enough to know that I need to seek out the people who do. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think I'm going to be a good sheriff is because, you know, I know I don't have all the answers. I like to, to build consensus. I like to look, identify problems. Then we figure out a variety of solutions. And then we find the people who know how to implement those solutions and we give them a running room to do it. That's one of the things I really think is important on any kind of program is a collaboration mm -hmm. between the state agencies that are out there community agencies, and that you really look at partnerships, you know, that really would work. It's, tr it's tremendously important, and, and you know, the, the existing support networks that are out there for both uh, law, uh, police and fire, we need to ensure that those are bolstered as well. We need to, you know, identify, uh, like we said, we talked about the BCI program. We need to, you know, ensure that they have the adequate resources to help the city of Brockton. The city of Brockton, you know, obviously has, you know, a problem with violence and gun violence and all that other stuff. And as sheriff, I don't want to ensure that they have the resources available to them to combat these issues in the city of Brockton. Because a lot of what you'll be doing with Suffolk, you know, being in the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department is supplementing the smaller towns that don't have... Well, what you do is you provide them resources. Um, and there's a lot of things, one of the things I'd like to talk with is with the chiefs of the, of the, the towns of the county is... You know, a lot of these towns don't have DARE officers. They don't have school resource officers. So would that be a way as a support network that we as a sheriff's department could help support you? Can we take some deputies? Can we train them as DARE officers and school resource officers and help the police departments with their programs? Have them come into the school every now and again and do the DARE program or, or you know, or do the, the education because the, we want to start education about the epidemic, about the opiate epidemic and anti-addiction education in the fifth grade. It's statistically shown that you need to start that education in the fifth grade to have success so that these kids don't become addicted to different substances. So it's starting at the earlier age and also establishing a positive identity for, you know, youth with police officers. And, and all there was actually a good meeting in the city last night about that about reaching out in the community policing and, and bridging the gap between the police and the public. And Sir Robert Peel said, the police are the public and the public are the police. And that was back in 1829 with the first professional policing, the Bobbies in England. Mm -hmm. And if we look all the way back to Sir Robert Peel's principles for law enforcement, they're still applicable today because the police need the public to help them do their job. The public need the police to make sure they have a safe environment. So what's the current situation that you've been improving upon now with the Sheriff's Department? Uh, that's a long list of things that I need to improve upon. The, one, of the, one of the big things is I want to improve on the level of staffing to ensure the safety of both the officers and the inmates. You know, right now they do have a staffing shortage. And one of the, one of the you know, it's, it's kind of a, a self-induced problem 
uh, that they have, they have the abilities to, to maintain adequate staffing level, but they, but they don't where they move too many people into specialized places without maintaining the people on the floor, the people walking a tier to make sure that they have adequate staffing. Right now, they're, they're, uh, the involuntary overtime is, is through the roof down there because there isn't an adequate staffing level. That would be the, one of the first things that I'd, I'd address to ensure adequate staffing. So ensure uh, that a corrections officer, you know, he, they have family issues. They need to be able to go home for child care. You know, you can't come to the end of your shift 10 minutes before you're about to walk out the door and they go, Steve, by the way, you're staying for another eight hours. And then you say, well, what do I do about my kid that's got to get off the bus? And then when you have that corrections officer that's there on involuntary overtime, he's being held or forced to work over, um, obviously, you know, after 16 hours inside, they're tired. And they, um, and, you know, I said, we want to make sure that they're attentive for both their safety and the safety of the inmates. And I think we're about out of time here. So if I could yeah. just have a moment. Sure. I'm Scott Becky. I'm running for Plymouth County Sheriff, and I'm asking for your vote. As a retired gunnery sergeant of Marines with 23 years of police and corrections experience, and as an attorney, I possess the combat-tested leadership, the education, and the experience to be the best sheriff in the history of Plymouth County. If you want to find more out about me, please go to my website, voteforvecchi.org, V-O-T-E, the number four, V-E-C-C-H-I dot org. Look us up on Facebook, Scott and Becky for Plymouth County Sheriff 2016, or just Google Scott Vecchi and it all pops up. That and does a nice job. I've done that earlier, and you've got a lot of information. Thank and you've you. got the background that we really need to have change. You know, I've seen too many times in my career the recidivism, people not making it because we don't have the training. So I really thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. And have a great day. Don't forget, vote for Scott Vecchi.